Scientific theories can have an influence on society, be it what is healthy to eat, whether some surgeries help or hinder, or even whether if the earth is flat. The theory does not need to be proven right, as even an idea on shaky ground can influence others' actions. One such theory would probably have one of the largest effects on the 20th century, as it would be used as a disgusting excuse for some of the world's worst atrocities. Following the scientific theory would lead to genocide, segregation and social racial laws that, by modern standards, leave a disgusting taste in the mouth, a convenient excuse to allow unacceptable actions by individuals and governments alike, and even in contemporary times, the subject filters its way into modern day society. It has mostly been used as an open door for misuse, scientific racism and tyranny. Today we're looking at one of the most dangerous scientific ideas, especially when used to prove prejudice and be used as an excuse for callousness. The theory is of eugenics and it's a long reaching effects in the 19th and 20th century. As such, I'm going to rate this subject here nine on my ethical scale. Welcome to the dark side of science. Our story starts with a very famous book by a much revered scientist, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. The work was released in 1859 and is widely regarded as the foundation of evolutionary biology. The new field of research would over the next few decades split into many different disciplines as evolution became more widely accepted. Many scientists looked to develop Darwin's ideas. One such person was one of his own cousins, Francis Galton. Galton was fascinated by his cousin's work and sought out to research variation in human development. He started to look at different aspects of human variation, covering anything from mental ability to height and from facial images to fingerprint patterns. Galton combined Darwin's theory of evolution with a concept of heredity to develop his new idea. The concept of genes came from Gregor Mendel's when, in 1865, the basic laws of heredity were discovered. His experiments with peas showed that each physical trait was the result of a combination of two units and could be passed from one generation to another. Galton, upon discovering the obvious variations across human population, wanted to see if defects or attributes are hereditary, passed from parent to child. For this work, a monumental amount of data was needed to be able to correlate any characteristic within individuals. This would lead to his 1869 book, Hereditary Genius, an inquiry into its laws and consequences. During the research for the book, Galton looked into who he described as successful men in a given profession. He surmised that their sons were more likely to achieve such eminence themselves than if they were not closely related to eminent individuals basically saying that successful people have successful children. From this, Galton theorised that it was evidence for genetic transmission of human intelligence. During his research for the book, he showed that the numbers of eminent relatives dropped off when going from first degree to the second degree relatives, and from second degree to the third. The book gained praise from his peers, including his cousin Darwin. But the work had limited appeal outside of the scientific community. He thought that the most desirable traits in humans were transmitted through heredity, and thus thought that selective breeding could achieve improvement of the race, where high achieving children be nurtured and given a good education, and once old enough, encouraged to marry with another high achieving partner. He also stated where the better sort of immigrants and refugees from other lands were invited and welcomed, and their descendants naturalised. As for the lower achieving people, he stated that less desirable people could find a welcome and refuge in celibate monasteries or sisterhood. This would become a theme for later eugenicists. Next, Galton looked into finding out if his theory of nature over nurture was true, and to do so, he envisioned studying twins that had been separated at birth, as if raised in different families with different social and economic backgrounds would this affect the intelligence of each sibling. 
who used questionnaires to collect data and published it in an 1875 paper, The History of Twins, in which he used to test his nature over nurture hypothesis. His next book would coin the actual term eugenics, although this was his first use of the word, as seen in Hereditary Genius, Galton had already been developing its main tenets, but had yet to name it. His book, Inquiries into Human Faculty and its Development, would first use the term eugenics, which opened up saying, This book's intention is to touch on various topics, more or less connected with that of a cultivation of race, or as we might call it, eugenic questions, and to present the results of several of my own separate investigations. He devised a plan that would give marks for a person's preferable family traits, and as such, that society should reward early marriage between families of high rank by provision of monetary incentives. In his book, he pointed out the tendency of British high society of late marriages between eminent people, which resulted in less of an average physical size of their children. Galton did not suggest any particular selection method, but instead hoped that society would naturally favour breeding desirable couples with the help of financial incentives. He would flesh out his term definition in his 1908 book, Memories of My Life, stating that the official definition of eugenics as the study of agencies under social control that may improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. The field still focused on selective breeding, much like with animals, through the means of financial encouragement. These ideas did not particularly take off in Galton's native UK, but they did in other parts of the world, most notably in the United States in the early stages of the 20th century. But before we look across the pond, let's summarise Galton's idea. It is split into two parts, positive and negative eugenics. The former being the promotion of good traits through encouragement of high achieving individuals having children and the latter being discouraging people with undesirable traits such as mental illnesses or any other handicap from having children. This second form of the theory would be the claimed justification for multiple human rights issues and ultimately genocide. Now let's look at the propagation of the field in the early 20th century. We'll come back to something I mentioned earlier, Mendel's Law. By the late 1800s, this theory was largely lost to obscurity. However, in the 1890s, botanists Hugo de Vries and Karl Korenz, simultaneously and apparently unaware of each other, rediscovered hereditary, which in turn independently verified Mendel's theory almost 40 years earlier, leading to the rediscovery of Mendel's paper in 1900. This brings into the picture William Bateson, an English biologist. Inspired by the works of both Darwin and Galton, he set out to further the study of heredity and in 1894, in unawareness of Mendel's work, released his book, Materials for the Study of Variation. Bateson, upon the rediscovery of Mendel's work, started to popularise the concept of Mendelian inheritance, even coining the term genetics in the early 1900s. Now that was a slight diversion, but it does play into eugenics and its importation into the US. Charles Davenport was a prominent biologist in the late 19th century. Throughout his studies, he gained a respect for Galton and his theories on encouraging the British elite to reproduce more. After the rediscovery and subsequent promotion of Mendelian inheritance, Davenport would seek to put these new discoveries into practice. Davenport was not the only one to embrace eugenics. Stanford president, David Starr Jordan originated the notion of race and blood in his 1902 racial epistle, Blood of a Nation, in which the university scholar declared that human qualities and conditions such as talent and poverty were passed through the blood. In 1904, Davenport became the director of Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. From there, he began a series of investigations into human mental and personality traits that have been inherited. Six years after working at Spring Harbor, Davenport started the Eugenics Record Office, a research institute that collected biological and social information about the American population, serving as a center for eugenics and human hereditary research. What was dark about the ERO? 
was that family pedigrees were recorded and it provided training for eugenics field workers who were sent to analyse individuals in various institutions, such as mental hospitals and orphanage institutions across the United States, essentially making a list of who the ERO deemed should be allowed to have children and conversely who should not be allowed to have children. The Institute had a Harry H. Lochlin as its director. We will come back to him in a little bit. Eugenic legislation began in the USA with Indiana becoming the first state to enact sterilization legalization in 1907, followed by California and Washington in 1909. Davenport would release in 1911 one of his most famous books, Heredity in Relation to Eugenics, and this writing would be a massive influence on the early 20th century eugenics movement. The book posited that many human traits were genetically inherited and that it would therefore be possible to selectively breed people for desirable traits to improve the human race. So much was the success of the book that it was used as a text for medical schools. In the early days of the American eugenics movement, a number of financial backers sought to support Davenport by funding several foundations. One such was the Race Betterment Foundation, created in 1914 by John Harvey Kellogg. Does that name sound familiar? Well, if you've ever been down a cereal aisle of a supermarket, then you'll know what I mean. And yes, it's the same person. The foundation was created from Kellogg's fears of what he perceived as race degeneracy. Davenport also found funding from the Carnegie Institution, Rockefeller Foundation, and the Harriman Railroad Fortune. In 1911, the Carnegie Institution supported a preliminary report of the Committee of the Eugenic Selection of the American Breeders Association to study and report on the best practical means for cutting off the defective germ plasm of the human population. The report had 18 points, and number eight was euthanasia. Along with the money, came political power and many willing ears within American high society. At around the same time, Henry Herbert Goddard, a prominent American psychologist, was also working with eugenics-based theories. He was one of the first proponents of the IQ test and was the first to translate intelligence test into English. Goddard was fascinated with intelligence within the population and pushed for most US institutions to incorporate IQ testing. Throughout his career, he helped develop the new topic of clinical psychology, with positives such as in 1911 helping to write the first US law requiring the blind, deaf and intellectually disabled children be provided special education within the public school system. He also argued that subnormal intelligence should limit criminal responsibility of defendants, but like many in this video, his ideas also had a darker side. In 1910, he advocated the labelling of subjects linked to their IQ, using the terms moron for those with an IQ of 51 to 70, imbecile for those with an IQ of 26 to 50, and idiot for those with an IQ of 0 to 25, for categories of increasing impairment. These labels would stay in mental health treatment for many years to come, and become part of the English lexicon. If you've ever called someone a moron, well this is where it came from. He went further advocating for people who fell into his moron category and below to be segregated from society as to not allow them to have children. As part of his intelligence testing program, he established exams on Ellis Island to find, in his word, feeble-minded immigrants. Interestingly, these tests would only be given to third-class passengers. Back in London, a new eugenics organisation was founded in 1912, named the Permanent International Eugenics Committee. It was a continuation of the first International Eugenics Congress. Interestingly, the first Congress was presided over Leonard Darwin, Charles Darwin's son, at the University of London, and was a global venue for scientists, politicians and social leaders to plan and discuss the application of programmes to improve human heredity in the early 20th century. In 1921, the committee arranged for a second meeting of the International Eugenics Congress to take place at the American Museum of Natural History in New York. This time, Alexandra Graham Bell was the honorary president, further adding to the famous names to the eugenics list. It focused on issues including human heredity, race differences, 
regulation of reproduction and eugenics. You see, eugenics found more fertile ground in the USA. There was a fear that non-Anglo-Saxon people were genetically inferior and thus water down the gene pool. Obviously this is untrue, but eugenics was the vehicle in which racist ideologies could travel. Harry Lochlin, the director of the eugenics record office, had become a pushing force in various eugenics-based legislation throughout the USA. In the early 1920s, Lochlin looked to further the number of states with compulsory sterilisation laws, as well as increase the numbers of sterilisations amongst the states that had enacted legislation. In Lochlin's mind, the current laws were poorly written, allowing states to employ sterilisation with less vigour than he would have liked. In a way to improve this stumbling block, Lochlin drafted a model eugenic sterilisation law to help things along better which was published in his 1922 book, Eugenical Sterilization in the United States. Although I won't read out the full model here, Lochlin included the following conditions that should result in compulsory sterilization. The feeble-minded, the insane, criminals, epileptics, alcoholics, blind persons, deaf persons, deformed persons, and indigent persons. By the 1960s, Lochlin's model was responsible for 64,000 individuals being forcibly sterilised under eugenic legislation in the United States. The law will be used as the basis for the law of the prevention of hereditary diseased offspring, the 1933 Nazi legislation that would ultimately result in 400,000 people being sterilised against their will. But Lochlin's exploits didn't just end with sterilisation laws. It was also used for extensive statistical testimony to the United States Congress in support of the Johnson-Reed Immigration Act of 1924. This law limited immigration to the United States from Asia and set quotas on the number of immigrants from the Eastern Hemisphere. Internally in the US, a number of states also brought in eugenics-inspired marriage laws forbidding weddings between people of different races such as Virginia's Racial Integrity Act of 1924. After the 1921 Eugenics Congress, the Permanent International Eugenics Committee was retitled in 1925 to International Federation of Eugenics Organisations, bringing in future Nazi Eugen Fischer. And this is where our story takes a turn into scientific racism. Davenport, in 1922, attempted to prove the dangers of interracial relationships with his book Race Crossing in Jamaica. The book gained wide ridicule, as the conclusions within stretched far beyond the data provided and in some cases even contradicted it. The eugenics movement in the US would peak in the 1930s with policies of both positive and negative eugenic implementations, with fitter families contests awarding medals for eugenically sound families, more states implementing sterilisation laws, and ever popular eugenic advertisements being commonplace. A disproportionately higher number of women of African and Native American backgrounds were forcibly sterilised under the laws written with Lochlin's model. Scarily, who was seen as genetically inferior was down to the flawed and racist thinking that non-whites had a higher chance of bearing children with mental and physical defects. Women in general were targeted with more of these laws resulting in roughly 61% of all eugenic sterilizations being performed on women. So much so was the influence of the US eugenics movement that the methods for eugenics-based discrimination would be imported back to Europe and a new hateful political ideology building up in Germany. Much like the rest of Europe in the early 20th century, eugenics was deemed by many German scientists as a legitimate study. The eugenics programs followed very closely the lead of the US. And once the Nazis got into power in 1933, the discrimination went into overtime. German eugenics was split between two types of thinking. The more moderate Wilhelm Schaumeyer, who rejected the race element in the field, but his version of the study would be by the 1930s be drowned out by Alfred Pollett and his more racist view of eugenics. He was a proponent of the cruel racial hygiene movement which he published in his 1895 book, Racial Hygiene Basics. In 1933, 
he was put on to the Expert Advisory Committee for Population and Racial Policy. This was tasked to advise the Nazi party on how to best implement eugenic and racial hygiene policies. And this brings us back to Lochlin's model of compulsory sterilisation and its implementation in the law for the prevention of hereditarily diseased offspring. This would put alleged cases of heredity illness up in front of a genetic health court. Hitler, in private, expressed his interest in pushing the programme towards euthanasia, but stopped short of implementing it during peacetime. But as Germany started rearming and setting its sights on war, the policy would be brought in. In 1939, a trial case of euthanasia was used in the murder of five-month-old Gerhard Kirchmer, who was blind as well as having physical and developmental difficulties. The murder was undertaken by Karl Bandt, one of Hitler's personal physicians. Three weeks after Gerhard's murder, the Reich Committee for the Scientific Registering of Heredity and Congenital Illnesses was created to register sick or newborns identified as defective. In October 1939, Adolf Hitler signed the Euthanasia Note, backdated to the 1st of September 1939, which authorised his physician Karl Bandt and Reichsteller Bühler to begin the Euthanasia programme, which post-war would be called Action T4. Germany had taken negative eugenics to a whole new level, seeing Darwinism as justification for the demand for beneficial genes and the eradication of the harmful ones. A number of physicians were authorised to decide which patients under their care would be deemed incurably sick and then euthanise the victim. The list of conditions acceptable for murder included, but wasn't limited to, schizophrenia, epilepsy, Huntington's cora, advanced syphilis, senile dementia, paralysis and terminal neurological conditions generally. Between 1939 and the fall of the Nazi regime in 1945, an estimated 300,000 people were murdered throughout Germany, Occupy Poland, Austria and the Protectorate of Bohemia and Moravia. This number included infant children, women and men. Various execution methods were experimented with, from lethal injection administered by a medical practitioner, to the first implementation of poisonous gas for large groups of victims. The first such instance in January 1940 was at the Brandenburg Euthanasia Centre. So much so were the Nazis impressed with the use of gas and the extermination activities during the Action T4 programme that it was expanded to an industrial scale for the Holocaust. As the war in Europe ended with Allied victory, the realities of the eugenics-based racial and social discrimination became public knowledge in the US and UK. The Doctors Nuremberg trials and the euthanasia trials highlighted the terrifying outcome of eugenic ideas, and thus the field fell out of favour. In the wake of the horrors of Nazi Germany, formalised policies of medical ethics and the 1950s UNESCO statement on race came into force. Several eugenic societies would back their definitions from the field, although forced sterilisations would continue into the 1960s, with it peaking in the 1950s. Eugenicists pushed more towards federal funded birth control measures after the invention of the pill for their deemed undesirable groups, such as ethnic minorities and the poor. But the field couldn't shake off its links to the Nazis, and as such, many societies hemorrhaged members. In 1959, a special meeting of Britain's Eugenic Society discussed ways to stop losses in membership, including the suggestion that the society should pursue eugenic ends by less obvious means, by the policy of crypto-eugenics, which was apparently proving successful with the US Eugenic Society. Many eugenicists went underground, pursuing other careers, with many new fields of study being influenced by eugenics. Prominent eugenicist Paul Popinol founded marriage counselling during the 1950s. He grew the subject from his eugenic interest in promoting healthy marriages between fit couples. Much of the eugenics-based policies were overruled during the civil rights movement, thankfully eradicating the racist and ableist abuse imposed by the government. However, as time has moved on, 
some eugenic ideas have become possible, but instead of coercion and abuse, modern science has allowed isolation of certain genes. This, of course, is through genetic screening, and although controversial, it bypasses the horrors of negative eugenics. There are still many modern proponents of eugenics-backed societies. One such was the Genius Sperm Bank, which ran between 1980 and 99, created by Robert Clark Graham. This bank was responsible for around 230 children conceived with sperm from high-achieving donors, of which some were Nobel Prize winners. But more than anything else, the field of eugenics produced some of the darkest outcomes of the 20th century. These ideas helped create division within societies, become the justification for genocide, and led many away from compassion, which should be the mark of a successful society. I wonder if Darwin could have ever envisioned the horrors that had taken inspiration from his work when he took those long strolls around the grounds of Down House. I know this has been a very dark and sad, as well as a long video, but I've only just scratched the surface. This video is a Plain Default production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plain Default videos are produced by me, John, in a currently sunny southeastern corner of London, UK. Help the channel grow by liking, commenting and subscribing. Check out my Twitter for all sorts of odds and sods, as well as hints on future videos. I've also got Patreon and YouTube membership as well, so check them out if you fancy supporting the channel financially. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching. <laughs>